The 2024 World Chess Championship continues between Gukash and Ding. We just saw the conclusion of game 14, which is the final classical game between the players. If either one gets a win, they immediately become the current world champion. And if the game ends in a draw, then we will go to tie breaks, which will happen tomorrow. So let's get into it and see what happened. Now, most importantly for this match, as I've already mentioned, everything's on the line. Um, but also, Ding has the white pieces. We just saw game 13, uh, true resilience from Ding Liren. Uh, Gukesh pushed, I thought, very, very nicely, but to no avail. Just better defense, honestly. Um, and with uh, the first move in the final classical game, Ding decides to go for knight f3. Again, stating that whoever wins this game will become world champion, but in the case of a draw, we still have tie breaks, of course, to decide things. So d5 played. Knight f3, whenever you see a strong player play knight f3, it's usually a move that's sort of just fishing for um, you know a response and then building your opening off of the response that your opponent gives you. Whereas something like d4, e4, very committal, your opponent sees, okay, he's playing e4 system, let me go c5, I wanna play Sicilian. But knight f3, they don't really know if you're gonna play c4, d4, e3, g3, b3. There's so many different ways you can still play. Um, but d5 is <laughs> for sure the, the best move against this. Ding goes for g3. We see c5, bishop g2. Once again, some kind of unique uh, stuff from the opening. Um, there was a, and I'm not sure if it was a full interview, but certainly one question which was asked to Ding, maybe at the end of an interview that I saw yesterday, which was uh, Ding, after an amazing defense today, what can we expect from the game tomorrow? And he said it will not be a short draw, which I thought was a really interesting uh, thing to say, interesting way to frame it, um, because it's information for the opponent. Uh, I don't know. It was just, uh, it was something that almost seemed to reveal a little bit of strategy that I hadn't seen from either one of the players throughout the entire match so far. Um, but it excited me. Uh, because I was like, okay, well, I guess uh, we're going to get something interesting. And hey, if the guys have a draw, it'll be a, a long uh, game, at least played out completely. So D4 played, E6 is the reaction. Um, one thing to point out is that black can take on D4 after knight takes. Um, you, If you're a chess player, you might be looking at this position and, and say, wait a minute, <laughs> this looks kind of familiar. Um, yes, if you flip it, and look from, from this side, it actually is the Grunfeld, so you're not confused, but Grunfeld with colors reversed. Now, of course, Grunfeld with colors reversed means you're just playing an opening that's already pretty good, played with the black pieces. Definitely not, I'd say, in fashion lately, uh, in favor of other things, but the Grunfeld is still a decent opening. However, you have an extra move in it. So if white plays c4 here, generally you're pretty happy playing an opening that's already has a you know, decent reputation, but you have an extra move. So he probably, Gukesh was probably not too excited to just play straight into that. Um, so instead he decided to play the, the move e6, much safer, and then he decides to take. So really driving the point home that, you know, he didn't want to play e5. He's happy with the pawn there and knight e7 even. So really uh, a different setup than I was expecting from the opening. Kind of interesting stuff from Gukesh here. And Knight g e7 is interesting enough that Ding really paused and said, okay, I need to figure this out. Took a 10, 15 minute think before playing the move c4. Now c4 is the usual move that you play. Whenever you fan out of the bishop here, especially against an opponent who has a d pawn, at some point it feels like you will see the move c4 um, from white. It just, it makes too much sense. You wanna open up that bishop. Um, even when you play d4, c4 is a really, really common follow-up. So. Not surprised at all to see it here. But after the move 97, I'm sure Ding was considering many things. Like one option, which maybe doesn't make a lot of sense is I would immediately be like, wait a minute, should my knight even just retreat? Because clearly this knight wants to go where this knight is. So taking, that, that move feels like it just helps black out. I don't wanna make a move like that. So I would consider going back or I would consider a move that Ding played, one of these two moves to break open the center. So I very much like the move c4. I thought it was um, in line with how he's been playing so far, his opening. Takes, takes, and knight c6. This is obviously what black is looking to do. Um, probably the, the main idea. 
the queen is actually really annoying here hitting this pawn so immediately i was like well is there a way to keep it there not really um queen g4 kind of walking into the line of the bishop doesn't feel great so queen d1 did make some sense and although the move d4 was played certainly d takes c4 comes to mind and at this point i was just thinking black feels like they're a little bit behind in in development i'm not sure how to describe it but um maybe knight d2 or queen c2 i am going to win this pawn back it is definitely impossible to defend it there's no b5 the diagonal is too weak black's pieces are not developed so we might see something like this um, could go knight d2 anyway but let's say this uh, we want knight c3 rook d1 hit the queen bishop looks really strong and if you compare the quality of the pieces anytime you have these like catalan structures or specifically this fianchetto bishop just compare the pieces because the position will often when white plays d4 c4 it will often look as though this bishop has great diagonals this bishop if the game is open has a great diagonal and then the counterparts for black are just not that compelling so white despite having a you know equal position pawns even symmetrical even i actually believe that white has a clear advantage here um with the open file easily accessed the bishop coming out amazing light square bishop lots to be concerned about for gukesh so he decides to play the move d4 he advances up pawn can come to e5 to support the bishop can even come to c5 um it makes sense to me d4 is is quite logical e3 to undermine and it was at this point where he used the bishop that i realized his strategy he was probably not going to be using the e pawn directly he wants to facilitate a quick castle and that makes sense you know playing e5 and opening up the e5 with your king there especially with the bishop still on f8 would not be that good so we see bishop to c5 now bishop c5 also kind of threatens to take so if white just goes a3 thinking okay I'd, I'd like to threaten b4 challenge the bishop and maybe the knight try to win this pawn black can just take and this is kind of inconsequential i would say either piece could take here if i'm being honest but position like this pretty fine for black i would say black is maybe not better that's quite a lot to say but certainly extremely comfortable and i believe just no problems out of the opening this pawn here is not great and the queen's off the board means the king can develop nicely to e7 doesn't even need to castle so this what i'm saying is that i think this carries a little bit of a threat here bishop c5 it's not just a defensive move um and that's why ding is more or less forced to capture so takes bishop takes back that might surprise you but um this move has something in particular that's wrong with it um i can give you guys a second right now to uh, think for yourselves you can pause if you want to but yes this uh this move immediately falls into the move b4 now it does not immediately win a piece because black has the option of just retreating but it is a terrible move because white gains a lot of space black has to retreat play a move like this and then we can just go like this knight c3 amazing position and no it cannot be taken due to that great queen a4 check move knight c6 we can just grab it and we will pick up this bishop so a nice little trap there but it means that you have to capture in the in the center with an unorthodox piece now gukesh certainly was not caught off guard here that he intended to do this but it's just a reminder the routine capture knight d4 does not actually work knight c3 ding allowing bishop take c3 i'm not gonna lie it's very tempting it's definitely a consideration bishop takes c3 i i was wondering whether we would see this probably just take back and at this point let's say we do something like this and castle white will sink the bishop in on d6 anchor it in with the pawn on c5 and the quality of that bishop compared to its counterpart on c8 will be felt along with the presence of the bishop pair so um you think about it for a sec it looks tempting double the pawns like that doubled isolated pawns but no it is no good Gukesh decides to just castle we see the move knight b5 looking to remove the bishop and then hopefully white's bishop is able to develop like maybe if the bishop goes here i might feel more comfortable on this diagonal if the bishop goes here maybe i want this diagonal tbd 
black decides to go bishop b6. And I thought at this moment, um, as I'm sure many players watching uh, would be able to see, along with the help of the engine, that I, it did feel relatively obvious to me that Ding should move the queen here and then maybe consider a rook d1 move. And the reason I say that, and let's take queen e2, which is the uh, recommended move here. So if the knight gets attacked, then rook d1. And now the thing is, we don't immediately have to retreat the knight back. There are some cases where knight d6 is played, but I would certainly still play knight c3. So let's put the queen somewhere. Queen e7, knight c3. And it's like, well, what's the difference here? Because knight d4 can still be played. So when knight d4 is played, yes, we have to move our queen, but it's not so obvious because this bishop cannot develop. Remember, it can't move because the e-pawn is in the way, but also the bishop's in the way of the b-pawn, which is in the way of the bishop. So it's quite a long uh, journey to get developed. Bishop e3 is coming. There happens to be a beautiful knight d5 resource here, which is a, a major threat in the position and kind of a cause for concern. And white's just developing with tempo. So that rook d1 just taking control of the d-file was a really key idea here that I think Ding just misevaluated or didn't give enough thought to clearly. Um, because yeah, for someone his caliber, I thought this was relatively straightforward. Instead, what we saw from Ding was the kind of passive looking b3, like not a bad move, but look, Gukesh is going to kick the knight out. Then he returns the bishop to d4, and then he anchors it in with e5. This is all kind of forced. I just thought after e5, everything made so much sense for Gukesh. All of a sudden, bishop has an easy development. The bishop here is actually pinning the knight, so it kind of delays white jumping in like that. And the bishop on d4 is anchored quite nicely. Compare that to a position that you could have had like this where this knight is absolutely not anchored in, right? Queen e4, bishop e3, we're ready to dislodge it. There are tactics in the position. The bishop does not have an easy development. So let's say you play the move e5, right? Knight d5, right? The queen has had to move to a square that's not comfortable. Um, but taking the d file is everything. So I, I don't know, I, I, you know, sometimes you hear people be like, oh, huge chance missed by ding because they see the engine go up. But this is one where I, I actually really believe that this was a, a fairly major chance to not win the game, but just seize a comfortable position that ding missed. I, I did think that this was one that was not that hard to spot, but b3, bishop b2, and then queen d2 at the end. Yeah, I, I wasn't too impressed by this. I thought Gukesh after the bishop b6, he might not be completely fine here, but I thought that he was well on his way to equality. Knight d5, absolutely. And uh, full credit to Gukesh for this one. I really liked the move b5. I thought he was uh, striking at the right time. His pieces are all developed to very nice squares. And yeah, I just didn't really, see a, uh, didn't really see a problem with this. So for example, if bishop takes on d4, this is a, a critical line, honestly. Um, takes and then f4 this is one move that first of all the engine does appreciate but it also makes sense to undermine that knight if that knight just stays on d4 it might be the strongest piece on the board so instead we see something like this black can play rook c8 and if takes rook takes c4 and it's actually white's knight that gets undermined first so kind of unpleasant there and of course you can't take this one because the knight is hanging. So I thought this was uh, maybe what Ding was gonna go for. It's also a really easy line to, to play. If the pawn takes, we have knight f4, um, and then we have a couple attacks there we can take. Pawn on d4 should be very weak. Another good looking position. So yeah, I actually thought bishop d4 f4 was what Ding was gonna go for. But instead we see this, which once again, I was I was just not impressed by this move either. I thought we're relinquishing almost all the potential advantage we could have had. Takes and knight f4. Like, look, knight f4 does work. I see the idea, we're hitting the knight, but I was starting to get the feeling when I saw the, you know, b5 takes and knight f4, I was like, really? This is the, the line that we've calculated out? And I, Predictably, Ding is down on time compared to Gukesh, but nothing crazy. 
Um, and there were some really, like takes in F4 I thought made a lot of sense. Um, he doesn't have to go into the line that we just discussed there. Um, I, I really did think that that this was playable, right? We don't need to take here. Instead, we could just defend. And yeah, I, th I thought this was definitely an attempt. But even this, remember, my initial problem is with the move B3. So I think Ding has missed one major chance to take the D file. And then maybe just a, a chance to keep things going here in this line. But now we can see after Knight F4, there's no way Ding is going to be better in this game because, yeah, he just takes it more trades, Gukesh defends the pawn. Taking here is just not at all what, what you're trying to play. Um, you start to get scared for your own king there. The queen comes out, the bishop, the rook sliding over. You can't play that way. So he finally takes the default and then he plays bishop f3 and ding, I have to admit, he had me confused here because I, I was seeing that he was missing opportunities you know, with queen e2 earlier, missing opportunities maybe with the f4 idea. Um, and that's fine if you're you're not trying too hard to win. But then my question is, why didn't Ding go for bishop here at this point? Now he played a fine move. He played bishop f3. But I was starting to get the feeling as I was watching. And by the way, I actually did uh, wake up for some reason and was watching. I don't know, just the hype of the, the final classical game had me interested, um, which is an indication maybe of of how interesting I think this match really has been. Um, but why not Bishop here? And then I was, you know, as I was processing this, I was like, well, to be honest, I don't know, is is it the move F3? Like, is this the move that, that bothers? Maybe takes and then something like F3? And I was trying to see how maybe the queen could get in and that could be a little scary, but this pawn really should be a goner. Like, not not something you can rely on. So I just wasn't seeing it. Yes, if the, the pawn takes, we just take back. The bishop has no squares, so you're gonna get a forced exchange here. And it just felt like, are we really playing for a win by bringing the bishop back? I don't know. At some point, you just have to admit like, okay, I'm not really playing for a win. I missed some chances, queen e2, f4. Um, yeah, bishop d7, let's just trade things off. So he goes bishop f3. I didn't particularly like this. Gukesh takes and plays b4. Gukesh has not broke a sweat this game. In my opinion, he's played very logically. Uh, B4 was a really nice strike, so credit to him for that. But in the opening uh, that Ding played, I actually thought there were opportunities for Ding to really get a just a pleasant position with that queen e2, uh, rook over to d1 idea. That was probably the biggest miss, and it wasn't too difficult either. And instead, we get this position where it just seems to be going worse and worse. Now it's not getting much worse than equal, but who would you rather play? I think it's obvious. The pawns are kind of fixed here. The quality of the, uh, the pieces and the position is clear. And okay, material is, is dead even. So worst case, black is even. There, there's really no way white's better. A4, what are you gonna do? Um, at this point, yes, this is a pass pawn, but it is also a weak isolated pawn. And I would tend to agree more with black in this case that it is a weak pawn because of all the firepower that's aimed at it and it literally cannot move. G6, uh, usually you want your escape square to be the opposite color of your opponent's bishop. If you're playing a position that just has bishops or bishop knight on the board, just a good habit. Um, obviously white had already played the move G3 so there was no option to do that himself. But uh, G6 makes a lot of sense for that reason also. There's no reason to grab this and walk into rook b1. So may as well make an escape square because that'll be helpful in any variation you play down the line. Queen d4 and Gukesh goes queen b5. He's not interested in a queen trade, which will you know, kind of help Ding push this pawn up and liquidate pieces. So instead he goes queen b5 and uh, Ding actually played the move. Yeah, and I, have, I was awake for this. So I was watching and Ding played the move b4 and I don't know, it just struck me as such a weird move. Like I, I understand that maybe we're going to lose this pawn. I, I can see a future where that happens, but I didn't feel like we had to make it so obvious. Like what, what about King G2, just a regular move? Um, still, it looks very dangerous to capture on B3 for black. I don't think Gukesh would do that. Lots for him to think about. Material, by the way, is still even, 
basically what I'm saying is I wouldn't just give up my pawn like that. It's a very strange uh, idea. I don't really get it. So b4 was played. Of course, Gukash just takes the pawn. And Ding goes rook a8, bishop takes. And with one hour on the clock, Gukash has an extra pawn. And Ding basically trades off all the pieces. Now, I can understand, based on the match, that Ding has shown quite a lot of resilience. He might feel very comfortable drawing this. Uh, believe me, the engine has this very close to equal. Um, nothing crazy. Like, this probably should be a draw, but it's not a rook end game. If it was a rook end game, which, by the way, was the same as last game, there was a rook end game that was a draw, that I understand. A rook end game, that's, that's theoretical. But add a bishop on the board... Um, I don't know, I have to start calling it out. That's unacceptable. Um, I don't think that this is an immediate draw. Now, Ding is a great defender. We might see a draw here, but it just doesn't make sense. Why make yourself work this hard? I didn't agree with, you know, that missing that Queenie 2 idea earlier. Certainly didn't agree with the way things traded after B5, just capturing, letting everything happen. And then definitely did not agree with B4 and I'm starting to think like, what's Ding doing? This is uh, game 14. This is the kind of game we're coming out with. It's like, okay, well, you better lean on your best skill that you've had all match, which is resilience. Because just felt very unnecessary to me to have the white pieces in game 14, final classical game and play like this, where honestly, and rightly so, Gukash plays on because <laughs> what the heck? Of course, I'm up a pawn. He's saying, and I've got bishops on the board. That's key, all right? It really makes a difference for potential winning chances. As you see here, he offers a trade. No, absolutely not. And while he makes a threat here, the bishop is able to defend. Of course, we won't see a rook trade either. Ding just seemed to be desperately trying to trade at all opportunities. Rook e1 is to stop bishop e4, another proposed trade, but he offered a bishop trade, offered a rook trade, and yeah, just felt like he was trying too hard. But nevertheless, Ding is a phenomenal defender. And guess what? He's here phenomenally defending. And he's going to have to do a phenomenal job because that's the, he's put himself in a position that does not look very enjoyable to me. He's shuffling here. Gukash doesn't need a winning plan because right now, if the, the match goes to tie breaks, you know, he's still got a chance in tie breaks. So he doesn't have to go crazy to try to win this game, but he certainly will keep playing. Why the heck not? Okay, we get this position. Again, some moderate progress here for uh, Ding. And by the way, um, you know, quite a bit of time on the clock, right? 16 minutes. I stand by what I've been saying that I just kind of felt this was super unnecessary for Ding to be in this position. Um, I don't think we've... I don't think we've seen something this blatant because I have seen Ding um, in in previous games. I'm trying to think back now, you know, just live here while we're while we're analyzing. But I'm remembering uh, earlier on, Ding had that opposite bishop end game. If you guys remember early in the match uh, with rooks on the board, and he traded the rooks. Thought he had some winning chances, but instead he traded the rooks. And while he was up a pawn, he actually gave away two pawns. So he was down a pawn now. And then he just made a draw because it's obviously opposite bishops. And I remember thinking, man, that's such a weird way to make a draw. <laughs> like, what the heck just happened? I mean, it's a draw, but weird way to do it. And I feel the same way here. I feel like it's a draw, but weird way to do it, right? Uh, rook b4, bishop e6 played, rook a4. So Ding's just kind of hanging out on the fourth rank saying, if you can't play this move, yes, you can check me, but I'm just going to shuffle. Rook b2. Bishop a8, I think the bishop could really go anywhere, but clearly there's a couple squares off limits here. Maybe you start to get a bit concerned about how the rook could be utilized, but I would still say bishop g2 is more than fine. Uh, bishop h1 is a, is a strange move. You definitely don't want to play that. And bishop c6, maybe he's thinking that it could be attacked by a king in some moments. So, and it's hard to read into it too much. This is out of the way, tucked away. King comes in, rook f4. King in. I thought, honestly, we would see Rook A4 here, uh, but the current world champion, Ding Liren, uh, he he makes the the move that he will come to regret for a very long time here. Rook F2 was played, and Rook F2, I can tell you, loses 
on the spot immediately irrefutable nothing ding can do anymore and i honestly feel like i watched a great movie and it, i just witnessed the worst ending terrible uh, i mean this this move especially with 10 minutes you know nine minutes on the clock is I mean, it has to be said, it's so far below world champion standards. Um, this is a, a two-move loss. Uh, basically, to explain, Ding is correct that you can exchange the rooks. This is a draw, because if black tries to break through, to be honest, I can just sit here and do nothing. Now, the problem is, the bishop he chose to put in the corner, if it was on any other square, it would be able to move diagonally, right? But that is not the case in the corner. So black can force the exchange of bishops and it happens to place him in a winning king and pawn endgame that Ding cannot do anything about. And we saw resignation just a couple moves later. Total heartbreak for Ding, but I find it hard to generate sympathy um, if I'm being honest. And this comes from someone who's definitely been impressed by Ding's resilience, his play this match, uh, you know, older generation of, of players myself. Ding is actually, uh, I think he's exactly my year. Um, I think he might be 1992. I played in uh, the same tournaments as Ding growing up. Um, and I was even looking back on some of my old tournaments. He was actually in them, <laughs> just crushing the field while I was uh, quite lower rated at world competition. So. This is someone who I'm rooting for, you know, the my generation. But this is indefensible. Rook F2 is just horrible. There's time on the clock. I mean, I see exactly what he's missing. He's just missing the bishop's not here because then he could avoid that trade. But it's still, it's inexcusable. And what's honestly more inexcusable to me and why this whole thing feels like it's built up to a position you know, a situation that Ding has almost deserved because he's put himself there is the way he played this game. This is not how you close out the classical portion of the match. He could have steered this into a drawish direction if he wanted to, but it seems like he started out ambitious, switched his, you know, changed his mind through uh, in the middle of the game. And all of a sudden he's trying to backpedal, make a draw, but he's making it too obvious. He's giving up too much. He, he gave away the pawn. He left the bishops on the board and then it's just like kind of a perfect storm that when you look in hindsight and you're like yeah he lost that match well let me look at what you know the decisions that led up to that and you can kind of see how it happened very sad you know don't like to see anyone like this um because this is just a an elementary mistake and one that ding as i said will come to regret just a win on the board for gukesh here but you know what? Gukesh had a lot of advantages in, in this match. Um, I believe he is now the youngest world champion ever. Just phenomenal uh, for someone at his age, what, 18? I mean, just insane, uh, truly. So full congratulations to Gukesh. I closed this analysis uh, recap series and the world championship uh, chapter by saying, Honestly, I was entertained by this match. I really was. I don't know if that uh, can be said for you guys as well, but I really feel like I watched an amazing movie, a movie that I didn't think would be this good, but then the ending was awful. Terrible, like just they didn't resolve anything. No. <laughs> uh, so that's how I feel right now. Gutted for Ding. Uh, so happy for Gukesh. Happy for Chess. Uh, I think having an Indian world champion uh, is clearly a very good thing for the game. There's no country that's you know putting more uh, time, energy, and cultivation into the game of chess, I feel like, than India right now. Um, so not bad to have a superstar young talent like Gukesh as the current world champion, for sure. So definitely a good thing for chess. Not to say it would be terrible for chess if, if Ding won, but just looking at some of the clear uh, changes and positives that come from Gukesh as, as a world champion, but also what a moment for him, right? Uh, he'll take it any way he can get it. He put pressure on the entire match and was able to get the win 
through putting on that little tiny bit of pressure and his opponent cracked when you might not expect it. And a lot of people had Ding as the favorite and Rapid going into it and even Blitz. So definitely a moment that unfortunately I think Ding will be looking at and reflecting on for quite a while, sadly. But the match is officially over. Um, we were gonna be back for tie breaks tomorrow, but there are no tie breaks needed. Gukash is your official 2024 world champion, which means that's the end of the recaps for me. I thank everyone for joining us uh, on this journey. It's been nice having you guys here, but congratulations again to Gukesh. But I can't believe the way this happened. I truly feel gutted for Ding, but you know, I reiterate that I, it's hard to generate that much sympathy because I did not like, I have to be critical of the way he played that final game. Gukesh is your champion, the 2024 World Chess Championship. Thank you for watching the recaps, guys. And I'll see you in the next Chess Bra video. Make sure to subscribe if you're not already. And see you in the next one.